Alright everyone, so this is the start of the evening and um, I don't know if you guys know but we've been run, this is a running group that we've been sort of running from across not 21 years but quite a few of those years we've run from here and over those years we've uh, met a lot of adventurous types of people um, we've had really great talks, we've had a um, guy that got the world record for windsurfing down the coast of Brazil, we've had a marathon de sable talk we had the SK night, which was to talk about the length of Tarara run with loads of people, well, loads of about eight people were talking about their epic exploits on the Tarara range. That was really good, we filmed that as well. We've had a SAR talk with Noel Bigwood, giving his uh, expertise on crossing rivers and, and what you can do in the backcountry, because we do a lot of backcountry running. But essentially, part of the evening, we've, and part of the ultra running world, we've come across really adventurous types. And um, along when you start meeting adventurous types, you meet other adventurous types. And um, so the two really, the people I think are really worthy of having a talk about what they've achieved. Because a lot of these times when people achieve something great, people don't understand it and, and then they carry on with their work. You know, and so that's nice. But I really think it's worthy of a discussion. And, Often these talks encourage others to give things a try. I'm not sure I'm going to try any of these things tonight. I did contemplate some SK at one stage, and I am still with the SK buddies. But on that note, Julian, I work with Julian, and he is a rock climber, and he does things like climb up very steep, steep um, faces and. Well, it started in England, as I understand it, but he does a bit of mountaineering, and I know he does, um, obviously, the talk tonight is about his climb with his friend from the UK up El Capitan, the nose, and you can start correcting me if I'm wrong, so I'm not a specialist at rock climbing, but essentially, I saw, I used to go to Banff Film Festivals, and I saw what Alex Honnell was doing, I just can't believe these people are doing these things, he does it for free climb, but this climb that Julian did last year, or this year, he, um, he's, he's very modest about what he's achieved, and, but I saw his talk at work, he did it in the cinema, in the cinema, and it's very impressive, I mean these, you'll see it yourself, but it's the kind of stuff that you just don't, you know, he's being very modest, but it's like, it. I can't put it in my head that people are climbing up this massive face, so I really think it's great, we've got Julian here tonight to talk about the climb up the El Capitan, and that's, um, he'll explain more about it, the history behind the route. It's one of the world's great routes in terms of big um, face climbing. I've done a bit of climbing, it's an awesome sport. And now the next talker, the talker after Julian will be Jean Beaumont. Uh, she's very well known in the ultra running world, internationally as well. And a lot of people uh, amongst our group and other ultra runners are just astounded by what she's been achieving. and. Dave Kettles was not sure that it's actually possible. I mean, he's been, I was talking about him, he still can't understand that anyone can do what she's done, but somehow she managed to run 200 miles in a race called Bigfoot 200 in the USA, and to most people, they can't even, um, count, they can't even read come to terms with what that means and if you say to people no it wasn't over a week or it wasn't a relay it was one person it's, it's a phenomenal achievement and when you're involved in ultra running you can really get a taste of what the, what some people can achieve but it's actually really inspiring to see what people are doing um, and that's the spirit of adventure and it's a, mag it's a really cool race as well i've done a bit of research in the bigfoot 200 um, the race and jean's going to be talking about that um, it's an epic story. We were following her on GPS, a dot, and there was a there was a bit of an incident late in the race. That all on the internet going, what's happening? What, why is she going around? Where's she gone? And there's oh no, it's falling out of connection. We you know we no one could work, but everyone was following. And on um, Wild Things NZ, the Facebook group. Everyone was so into it. I was going, where's she going? And everyone was really stoked because Jean was doing really well. She was smashing every, well, even a lot of the guys. But um, she can talk you through it in a very um, sort of modest way. Again, she's very modest. And um, 
it's just some of the stuff these people are achieving is really inspiring to me and I hope it will be to you people as well. But yeah, enough of the introduction. So first I'll introduce oh, Julian, he'll explain what the donation's for as well. Oh yeah. But yeah, so first of all, welcome Julian. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Um, good evening. Can you hear me like this or would you like me to talk like this? This one? Okay. Um, all right, so um, just a little bit about me. I sort of got into climbing when I was a teenager and I think I know a lot of people who got into something when they were teenagers and it kind of sticks and that becomes your default place to go to be happy. And I think uh, climbing and mountains and rocks is, is the thing for me. So I um, did quite a lot of climbing as a student and um, off and on through my relatively adult life. Um, and, but then not that much over the last 10 years or something. So I've done quite a lot of rock climbing and I've done sort of quite some big mountains like some of these big New Zealand mountains. Um, but this thing here is a, what we call a big wall. So it's, a, it's not quite, well, it depends how much of a superhero you are. If you're a superhero, superhero, then you run up this thing and it, you don't even notice much about it and you've, it's all over in a couple of hours. But I'm not one of those people. Um, this is a kind of, that, that thing there is El Capitan on the left and it's about a kilometre high and then the, the rock climb that we did goes straight up the edge that you can see. So it's a kind of um, steep, very vertical climb and unless you're a megastar you actually have to climb this using artificial aids. So you're actually putting gear into the cracks hanging on the gear, reaching up, putting the next piece in and hanging on that one and climbing a bit higher and it's a very slow laborious process and because um, it's slow and laborious you then start to need lots of things like extra food, stuff to sleep on ledges with and water for several days and all of that so suddenly you're carrying 50 plus kgs of gear with you plus 20 kilograms of climbing gear and it all becomes a kind of huge logistical exercise. So we'd never done this before, me and my friend who, who came with me. So um, that was why it's kind of, uh, it was quite a thrill to give it a go. Um, so I'll, I'll just tell you the story of that if you like. Is there anyone here a climber or are you all runners? A climber, two climbers, three climbers, four, ooh, we've got a few, awesome. Has anyone here been to Yosemite to climb? Okay, sweet, so Yosemite is one of the world's most spectacular well-known rock climbing areas and the nose of El Capitan is probably the most famous rock climb in the world which is a bit of an incentive to go and climb it. N not necessarily because it's the hardest but just because it's cool and big. Um, so this is Alan on the left and I went to university with Alan and we used to we were kind of climbing bums in the old days and I hadn't seen him for 35 years and we met up on Facebook and the conversation sort of quickly went to hey what about we go climbing and oh what about going to Yosemite and oh what about blah 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 so we, we dreamed up this idea of doing this climb and it, it's one of those ideas that quickly became planning and without really realizing it we suddenly bought tickets and we were training to do this thing and so we were discussing it and stuff so um, we ended up there arriving in Yosemite Valley and training for this was you know what do you do for training for a big wall in Lower Hutt. <laughs> There's not very many big walls. You go to Hang Dog and climb 13 metres up and down and then up again and I did that 100 times in a couple of hours once just because I thought I ought to do lots of this. Um, go running, do lots of press ups every day and pull ups and just try to get physically fit and then read all the theory about how you handle the ropes and all of that stuff which is quite complicated. Um, and then we just go there, borrow and beg and grab the gear from anywhere we could get, get it and start to practice and so if you read the books they say you've got to be there for three weeks or a month before you try anything big on El Capitan and we thought haven't really got that sort of time but we'll give it a week and give it a go. So um, we, we did a few short climbs and we rigged up the ropes around trees in the campsite and we sort of practiced a few techniques and then we thought what we should do next is really do a practice climb and then we thought, but that's another waste of time. Why don't we just practice while we're climbing El Capitan and sort of do it at two things at once. So we thought we'd do that. So um, that's the, the mountain from head on. So one of our practice climbs took us right up opposite 
about halfway up the height of El Capitan and sort of looking straight at it, so that was quite handy. And um, we, that was so the objective is to climb the kind of boundary between the light and the shade in the picture. And there is a little feature called the sickle ledge. So on El Capitan, there's six ledges on the way up, and we planned that we would sleep on these as we progressed up, so we had to get from ledge to ledge each day. The sickle ledge is the first one, it's about 200 meters up, and we thought, why don't we just climb up to sickle ledge and then abseil down again, and then we've practiced aid climbing, and we've also done a bit of the climb, and then we'll cheat and by going, bypassing that section by going up some fixed ropes and ca carrying on the next, next time. So that's what we did. So this is us sort of on our first go climbing the lower section. And in the picture you can see Alan who's on the, or maybe it's me, I'm not sure, on the left there. And there's some other characters climbing up in the picture. I don't know if you can see this, but there's a tiny little dot up there and that's on Sickle Ledge. So um, we, we spent probably five hours getting to Sickle Ledge. Got there, thought, awesome, we've sort of probably done the, the, the technically as hard as it gets to climb this rock face, so we know we can do it, and now we've just got to be mentally sort of determined enough just to realize that that's going to happen and not, not have any doubts. So um, it was a bit scary. This is a moment when I thought I might die because I was trying to go sideways um, from a fixed point horizontally across to another fixed point and I couldn't quite remember what the manual said. <laughs> and uh, one, what it does involve is doing some stuff and then untying your actual rope from your waist harness while you're hanging on other bits. And I was looking at what I was hanging off and thinking, should I really be untying right now? I don't <laughs> quite know. It doesn't feel right. And um, so I, I sort of, for a, few, a couple of minutes, I think, oh, I actually think I could die if, if that little thing pops out. This isn't good. So um, I was a bit terrified. But anyway, I did manage that. And then um, after that, I decided to think hard before I had to do this again. So we got to the ledge. And that's looking down from the ledge. And um, there was actually a fixed rope already in place. So we could abseil straight down 200 meters to the ground in a few steps. And um, we sort of ticked it off. OK, great, cool. We've, we've sort of started off. The next um, challenge was you've got this 50 kilogram haul bag of all your gear and food and sleeping stuff and that's got to come with you. So you can't possibly you know, carry that up on your back. So you have a pulley system. So the leader goes up, anchors on the anchors or anchor points and gets established. And then you have a pulley system to haul this bag up to the, up to the rock. So the next plan sort of was this thing where we, we'd go up the fixed ropes and haul the, the haul bag up. Now, this is actually quite thrilling because what you do is you, you get established on the anchor point and then you tie a huge loop of rope between yourself and the anchor, maybe 10 meters. And that with the, on the other side, you kind of attach yourself to the haul rope, which is going over a pulley. And what you do then is you leap off backwards off the cliff and hurtle down backwards for 10 meters while the, while the haul bag comes up sort of alongside you sort of thing. And the first time you do that is like, what the hell, <laughs> you know, this is insane. And then after a while you, you relax and it just becomes sort of a bit normal. Um, okay, so day three. So by the way, I should say, we were jet lagged. I didn't sleep for a week. And, to, and on the beginning of the climb, which is this day, we got up at four in the morning, having slept in the car really badly. And we were both absolutely exhausted before we started. So um, as we were walking up to the cliff, I was just hoping that Alan would say, oh, come on, I'm too tired. And he didn't say anything. So we just had to carry on. I, I didn't dare be the coward, which I was really. So um, anyway, there we go, six in the morning, off we go. We're on the bottom end, um, Alan's leading up um, up the ropes. So to climb a rope that's just hanging there, you have a, a couple of clamps and they go up and they lock and then you use the next clamp uh, to con sort of work your way up um, like a monkey up a stick. Um, all right, so six o'clock in the morning we set off and that's now looking down to the sickle ledge which is there. Uh, so we're sort of on our way and 
Um, very quickly, I kind of realized this is not about coming to a lovely big ledge and tying on and standing or sitting somewhere. It's about coming up a vertical wall with no footholds and clipping into a couple of bolts which have been put in place and hanging there. And everything is about hanging with no footholds at all. Um, and so you, you just mentally, you've just got to tune into this rope is going to hold me and I've just got to trust it. Um, and so, so it starts to get steep and these cracks just continue up. And in a second, I'll show you the kind of basic technique for getting up this stuff. Um, Hotshot climbers just race up this with their bare hands and put the gear in to protect themselves free climbing. But we're, in our state, we were sort of so psyched up, we did the normal thing, which was to actually hang on the gear pretty much most of the way. Um, so this, this actually uh, is a little segment, like a video. And it shows the technique of climbing. First of all, actually the leader going up and putting some gear in, and then a little clip of following across a section from as a second coming up. Uh, so, oops, sorry. This one what is it? Okay, there we go. So hopefully this works. Okay. So that's Alan. He's got these this blue and yellow thing are the stirrups they're kind of little step ladders and you stand in them and you climb up them and when you've got your weight onto one of them the, the lower one is free to move up so that you then put some gear in the crack above you and you've got lots of gear to choose from to fit the crack so you have various cans and wedges and stuff and so that's pretty much the process and then when you're coming up from below following the leader this is just stepping across and uh, sort of following a section where I've got to go sideways which I by now had kind of worked out so it was a bit more relaxing yeah so okay so um this is the next morning. It took us 18 hours to reach the ledge that we wanted to get to. So we arrived at midnight and totally knackered. Um, but this is quite a good ledge because there was room for two of us to lie down and it was very flat. Um, and this is the best sleeping accommodation on the whole climb because it's the best big ledge. So you're totally tied on all the time. You don't untie uh, at all ever to sort of, yeah, you're always attached. So in that sense, you start to relax about um, being in this ridiculously exposed situation. So the next day we're sort of carrying on and um, yeah, there's a section here where there's some fixed bolts so the, there's absolutely blank rock, there's no cracks to put gear in so Alan's just clipping into some bolts and um, climbing up. It's actually super safe, you're attached, no problem. Uh, the, the red rope coming down is the haul rope so that's attached to the bag which is going to, when he gets to the anchor he will haul up behind him. Um, what was interesting here was that I was holding the rope at the top of a feature that's called the Texas Flake. The Texas Flake is a big sheet of rock that's attached to the side of this rock face and it's kind of leaning out a bit and it's quite a difficult thing but you've got to climb up behind it and then kind of chimney up and you end up sitting on the top of this huge flake. And so um, I'm, that's looking down from the flake. Um, I'm sort of sitting on it, it's not very wide, it's just about 40 centimetres wide, I'm sort of sitting there. And a couple of guys are coming up from below and they're racing up, they're practically running up this climb. So th these are the, these are, we're talking these are the hot shots and they're practicing um, to beat the speed record on the nose of El Capitan, which happens to be two hours, 22 minutes. Um, so they, they basically, they're not, they're not hanging on gear, they are just running up this, occasionally putting a piece of gear in for protection, but not very much. And they are just unbelievable. So um, uh, there's one of them, he's a guy called Brad Gobright, and he wants to beat Alex Honnold's um, speed record for the nose. So he's, doing, he's running up and he's practicing the hard moves up and down a few times, and then he runs up the next section and practices some difficult bits. It's just like a game, it's like playing, it's like unbelievable, it's like watching a squirrel going up a tree. And um, so anyway, he comes and sits on the ledge beside me with his mate, 
and we were sort of chatting away, waiting for my friend Alan to keep going. And um, suddenly both of their phones go off and they read this text message which says, this guy Alex Honnold has just free soloed El Capitan round the corner. And so um, this is just to give you a little bit of perspective about um, why I should be modest, Chris. <laughs> because um, that's the climb we did, okay? Those little, I don't know if you see little triangles, that's where we slept at night, so there was four days and a final sleep at the top. By the way, is this microphone working? I can't tell. Is it okay? Okay. Um, and so that morning, um, that's us, you know, we did this in four days. Wow, fantastic, aren't we? Amazing. That morning we did that little blue bit, so if you can't see that, there's a little blue section here. And we were sort of just done this in the morning, and in the meantime, Alex Honnold had just climbed that without a rope, uh, just a chalk bag and a pair of shoes. And he'd done it in less than four hours. So just to compare four days, four hours, it makes me feel fairly modest. And um, there's Alex Honnold free soloing up an overhanging crack near the top of El Capitan, powering his way up. Um, and it's basically, to put this in perspective, this is the greatest free solo rock climb ever done and possibly that ever will be done. Never say never, but it's way beyond the scale of what anyone's ever achieved in rock climbing previously. So it's quite cool to be sort of sitting on the same piece of rock as Alex Honnold doing his thing. Um, right, so off we go, you know, sort of chuggling along, sort of getting into the rhythm of this now. And um, this, was a, this is a famous section, which is so when, yeah, when you come up a crack and you run out of anything to hang on to, you don't have many options left. One of the options is to lower yourself down and start swinging sideways back and forth until you can lunge across to an adjacent crack system and grab hold of it and climb up there. So this is um, a place where you have to do that. And it's called the king swing because it's the biggest one of these. There's about nine of these things that you have to do. And so this is quite famous and it's, it's a bit notorious because lots of people get really freaked out. So whoops, what I'll do, I think, I've got a sort of attempt at a video of this. Might give you an impression. It's kind of, you're starting to feel like you're just way up in space. There's a long way to the bottom and you're kind of committed. Uh, oh, that didn't work that time. This may or may not work. I'll just try it one more time. Is there a little video thingy? Yes, there is. Okay, mm -hmm. so we're standing on top of a very little ledge. And I've actually got a GoPro stuck on my head just because I want to show off, so I am. So Alan's basically lowering me down. He's got the rope belayed from above and I'm just tied on the end. Um, and it's up to him to lower me down the right amount. And then when I'm sort of at the right, what I think is about the right height, I've just got to start running back and forward across the face. It's pretty cool actually, you're kind of swinging around, it kind of feels quite quite exciting. There's not much to hold on to. Basically, you've got to get around this corner, which is a bit. I can't really see where you're going. That's the way. That's the whole one, huh? That's where my GoPro went out, so I couldn't show you the rest, sorry. Um, so, okay, now we, we've, we've gone past the famous king swing and we're sort of getting committed. Um, we've got to go up. It's really hard to go down from this point. Um, and so Alan's following there. Just a 
couple of things. We carried 30 kilograms of water and you just got to keep drinking because this is California, it's very hot and you dehydrate a lot. We stumbled upon this little frog. And how does this frog get past the king's wing? I don't know. Presumably came down from above, but how does a frog get halfway up El Capitan? And what does it do when it's there? No idea. See that little frog there? It looks exactly like a rock. Um, and so the upper section of El Capitan is kind of starts to overhang. So it just when you think it should be getting chilled out, it actually gets more exciting. Um, and this is our second campsite. So this is called Camp 4. Um, not much to sleep on, really one ledge for one person. So I had to sort of sleep on this slopey bit. And I basically just tied lots of loops of rope and stuck my legs and sort of hung there for the night. Didn't sleep very well in, again. So on we go. Um, next day, this is called the Great Roof. There's lots of really cool names for features on, on this route. Yeah, the Great Roof and the, yeah, or just cool names. So this is the Great Roof. And um, this is now, you, look, that's the bottom, looking down there. It's a long, long way down. Um, this is Alan taking a photograph of me, sort of about to follow him up. And um, you're just in a sheet of granite. You can't really believe where you are. It's kind of a bit bizarre, really. What, what, what normal people would do this? Um, and this, this um, we were carrying on feeling fairly good that, that progress was all good. And Alan was going up this section, which is called the Pancake Flake. Pancake Flake is a part where you can free climb quite a bit. So you can go in sections without putting gear in. It's quite hard, but if you're, you know, it's, it's sort of protected and it's okay. And so Alan went up and then he put a piece of gear in, which he thought, okay, I've had enough free climb. He put a piece of gear in and, and put his weight on it and it pinged out without him expecting it to. So suddenly he was flying through the air and there was a bit of a gap between his, where he was and the last piece of gear he had in. So he was flying down, face outwards, upside down, towards me from above screaming very loudly uh, and in a state of high agitation, um, very high agitation. It, and, I, and the thing is, I, I expected him to stop quite quickly and he wasn't stopping and I was thinking, oh my God, something's not good here. Um, so he fell about 15 meters or so and eventually stopped and continued screaming until I told him to get the right way up and calm down and then he did that and he calmed down and then he just got back onto the rock and he carried on climbing. I thought, well, that's impressive. He was, one minute ago he was like all adrenaline and now he's got all cool again. So he, he's into painting, so he made this image of himself hurtling down the, the rock face. I thought that was cool. So he's saying, hmm, I must remember to point my toes. Um, this is our last campsite, very small. And, uh, and again, you think, oh my God, I've got to spend the night here. The um, question people have is what about going to the toilet and all of that side of things. Um, the rules are you cannot leave anything solid on the rock face. That would not be nice for other people. So it all happens in like a plastic bag and it all goes stuck into a little container and you take that with you off the mountain. But weeing off the side of the mountain is fine. Which means that as you approach the, the night's accommodation you start to smell this really strong sort of urine smell. It's pretty gross. And you kind of, it's, yeah, you just feel the grubbiest thing. Even if you're not necessarily grubby, you feel grubby and you're sweating and all of that. So it's a pretty grubby experience, really. Um, yeah, so uh, there we are, sitting on the ledge and um, having a nice kit. That's looking down on the ledge from above the next day. So now we're sort of coming to the final, final sort of section. Last day, tired, but we've got the rhythm. And everything is geometrically stunning, you know, looking up, looking down. The rocks are incredibly sort of smooth and impressive. And somehow you're there and you think, really? How did I do this? Um, so this is very close to the top and it look, looking down from above, it makes it look like the bottom section is very shallow angle, but it's very foreshortened. It's probably about 80 degrees, that lower section. So um, it, is, it does feel like a long way up. At the very, very top, there's actually an overhang. So you actually go out right at the very, very end above everything. And um, that's pretty cool too, because it involves swinging out. Like when I, I went up after Alan and I had to unattach the, the, the links, the things, 
which meant that I wasn't attached to the rock anymore and I had sort of swung out into space and then came back again and then climbed up and got the next piece out and swung out again. So by this point I was just thinking this is almost a circus. Um, I did actually drop the rope at one point, which wasn't serious, but it, Alan thought it was. And so he screamed at me. He, he did a lot of screaming at me actually. I thought, um, he's not very calm when he gets a lot of adrenaline and at one point I thought I really have to scream back at this guy just to see what it's like and I yelled at him and swore at him and it was great it felt good <laughs> um, but mostly you know it's all about staying fairly calm if you can so there he made this little um, image of me dropping the rope oh dear I've dropped the rope which I thought was quite funny too